Okay, good afternoon everyone. Uh, just a few announcements. The first one is that as uh, posted on the course website, there's a new memo. Uh, that's probably the final memo for this course and that memo looks at what we're expecting from the project in terms of answering, answering just some loose questions, loose-ended questions that came up during the meetings. So as the memo explains, it's not uncommon that when you work in engineering design, um, that there's almost daily meetings as a new pro plant or project is being installed uh, or even just planned and every day new information comes through, changes get made. So what I've done is rather than feed you little pieces of changes every day is collect them all up into this final memo. So there's about 17 or 18 different points in there. Uh, please review those. They will impact how you plan your project going forward for the next uh, few days. The other issue is on grading and the midterms are returned. I will also um, start to put the grades on Avenue just so that you can cross check that we've recorded your grades accurately. I haven't been doing it up to now because uh, quite, quite frankly entering grades into Avenue is a bit of a pain and it's not my priority to spend my time on that and nor the TAs and plus because we've been doing everything electronically you actually do have your grades so um, it's just something that you will see coming through over the next few days as I've got a bit more time this week. Um, the next point is very important. It regards the tutorials on Thursday and Friday coming week as well as the week after. Those tutorials are unique to MacMaster. No one else that we know of in chemical engineering runs those tutorials quite like that. And it's going to teach you an incredibly valuable skill of troubleshooting. Okay, if you speak to any engineers that have graduated in, in the chemical engineering, they'll say 90% of them work on troubleshooting. That's most of their daily activity. And so being able to experience that in a, in a simulated way is critical to your development. Um, but because troubleshooting is such a group activity, we cannot have anyone arrive late for those tutorials. Okay, so please arrive late, uh, arrive on time. <laughs> And um, we'll, we'll start your group off in that way. Now, if, you, if you're unable to make it because you have a job interview or some legitimate excuse ahead of time, um, you do need to let me know earlier and we can shuffle you around to, the, to another day or we can make something happen. But I can't have any surprises on Thursday or Friday because you're really not, um, it's not fair to the other two people that you've let down, okay? So we need all three people in the group to, to make that work. The next uh, and final announcement is uh, Tyler, your TA, has offered to run a review session for this uh, course the day before the exam. So the exam is on the 13th of December. So the 12th of December, um, Tyler is offered in JHE 342 um, from 5 to 8 p.m. Um, that's the only time that we can get a room really on campus around that time of year. So that uh, is a three hour review that Tyler will be going through and you can come with your questions. The exam is on the 13th of December in the evening. Um, I'm not sure how he's going to run it. It's, I, he's totally organizing it on his own and I've got no involvement with that. Okay, so he's volunteered to do that. Any other administrative issues that we can clear up quick before we move on? Okay, so uh, one final point that I might emphasize is next week, Wednesday, the 18th, we're going to have a pretty amazing guest speaker from Praxair. Um, he's uh, the community of practice leader in globally in Praxair for project management and cost estimation. Um, so he's, he's got a lot of experience related to topics in 4N. Please come with questions. Um, He's, I, I'm expecting that will be a really good talk. So Wednesday's class. Okay, so let's uh, look where we left off here last time. We said we looking at the safety hierarchy and we spent all of last class looking at just that first layer, the basic process control system. And above that, we're going to look at today alarms and the safety interlock system. Okay, so if an event is not stopped by the basic pr uh, process control system, it moves on to um, 
an alarm stage, which hopefully will be able to be dealt with by the operators, and if not, we'll look at SIS. So in the basic process control system, we just need to finish up around this topic. We didn't quite complete that. We said last time we will always control unstable variables. The classic example of an unstable variable is level in a tank. So level in a tank, always unstable, always has to be controlled. Um, a quick control variable is a variable that will move much faster than an operator could, could anticipate and can cause a safety problem. So pressures, for example, can rise uh, very rapidly if a valve should be closed. Um, pressure and temperature are two of those exothermic reactions where temperature runaway could be an issue where that climb in temperature or climb in pressure can be happen so fast that it can exceed a safety threshold. Pressure as well, a tank that's drawing a vacuum, right? There's a certain lower bound before that tank will implode on itself. In fact, the vast majority of industrial accidents related to storage vessels are due to operators sucking the tank in to itself. Right? A tank can support outward pressure very, very well, but inward vacuum is not, not tolerated. Um, in fact, the pressure that's exerted by a cup of coffee or a cup of tea is pretty much the pressure that, it, that most tanks are designed for, for vacuum. So we cannot allow those tanks to implode on themselves, and we would need to have loops that can quickly relieve that vacuum if the tank is not rated for it. So there's going to be a safety bound. If we see the pressure dropping towards that safety bound, we have to take um, action. So our control system is very well suited for that. We designed two control loops last class specifically for safety, the level down here and the pressure up there. And let's take a look at just one other issue. If we're dealing with this idea that control at this layer is so critical, we have to make sure that everything works well. So here's, here's, a, here's a reactor. It's exothermic. We need control on it. Okay, it's a fast variable. Temperature leaving that exothermic reaction. We don't want it to run away. And so the mechanism that's been used here in this particular reactor, this is not true for all reactors, but one way you could deal with that is to actually introduce more cold feed. It's a valid way of manipulating the temperature. Um, and so here we've done that. Now, if temperature is critical and we don't want it to get to a safe, unsafe point, we do need to ensure that we always measure temperature over there accurately. So currently, if this temperature sensor goes offline, Okay, so you've all taken 2i, and you know that a thermocouple is two wires that are there touching each other, and the electric potential set up, and some, one day the wire splits. And now you're reading zero volts, and it records zero Kelvin. Okay. This controller is then going to take an undesirable action when that temperature sensor fails. So when we have a control loop that is there for critical safety reasons, we have to evaluate the reliability of the sensor technology then. So this is no different to you having a job interview that you have to travel to Sarnia and your interview is at 8 o'clock in the morning. What do you do? <laughs> you spend the night in Sarnia. That's one option. If you're traveling early, you wake up and you set two alarms and three alarms. You have your mom phone you as well to make sure you're up, right? So you, you don't, the moment you have a critical loop here, you don't rely just on one sensor because if someone comes and takes it offline for calibration or that sensor fails, um, an undesirable action might take place. So what we do is let's, let's illustrate that we'll measure the temperature twice and we'll typically use a different technology on the second sensor. I mean, the, certainly the one thing you do not do is go buy two sensors from the same vendor from the same batch, right? If they've manufactured both these sensors at the same time and there's a manufacturing defect, it's pretty much guaranteed that both sensors will fail on you. So buy one sensor from one vendor, another from, a, from the other, put those two together, and then you use a comparator. Y, when you see a Y in your symbol, it's a comp comparison or it's a calculation of sorts happening. And so we use the most conservative 
sensor. Now, so conservative doesn't mean use the lowest value. In this case, it actually means use the highest of the two to control against. So always assume that you got the worst possible condition there at that sensor. So use the highest temperature, and that's the value. So if the operator does come and take T1 out for calibration, and it now reads zero degrees, you're still using T2 or the other way around. Okay? So you always get the highest value and put that through your feedback controller. Okay, so that's an important point over there. Now, we looked at fail open and fail close, and I'll talk a bit what that is. Um, but from what you saw in the tutorial, should that valve fail open or fail close? Okay, fail open. So if, if the valve fails, we want to be introducing cold feed in there to keep the temperature down. Now, let's take a look at that, right? So um, maybe just, just to emphasize what we're doing here, when we're looking at the basic process control system, um, let's just quickly recap a bit of theory from 3P. Um, we know that we've got our set point coming in. You're comparing your set point to your sensor measurements. So you've got your sensor over here. And once you get your sensor value, you compare it to your set point, you bring it into your controller. Okay. Your controller goes to a valve, and that valve then goes to your process. So it manipulates something that impacts your process. And we loop around. Okay. So what we've looked at so far is we've looked at the controller. We've covered that. We've looked at the sensor. You'd have redundant sensors. But one thing we haven't considered that makes a control loop work is the valve. Okay. So we... we Remember that the system is only as good as the sum of its parts, or in fact, because it's in parallel, it's only as reliable as the product of the reliability of all the elements in the path. So the controller's reliability multiplied by the valve multiplied by the sensor's reliability gives you the global control loop reliability. So we put good computers on there for our controller. We put good computers, uh, sorry, we buy good quality sensors, but we haven't spoken yet about the valve. Well, let's take a look at that. So your operator drives past the plant in the forklift truck, and he's texting away and kills the pneumatic airline feeding the valves. What happens? So those signals in that control diagram are transmitted by pneumatics. So someone goes and damages the line or hits it with a spade, or breaks it in some way, the compressed air that feeds that, that line fails for some reason. And so all of those are, are very feasible possibilities. That valve's position will change. Remember, compressed air is used to affect the valve's position. So let's see how. Here's a valve. It's called ATOFC, ATO, air to open. So it uses compressed air to open it up and it will fail closed. And the reason why it will fail closed is because we have a spring over there that's pushing down on the valve stem. So naturally the spring is pushing down. That's a mechanical device. It's not going to fail, or incredibly low probability of that spring failing. And we're using compressed air. That's the load line with a double dash indicating pneumatics. So compressed air is pushing up against there. So your control loop sends a greater or a small amount of compressed air there to open the valve between 0% and 100%. Okay, so that's how the control loop works. So if someone goes and cuts that line over there, and you've got no more compressed air, this valve will fail closed, will fail shut. The converse is that you put the air on the other side and load the spring. So this valve will open if there's no air. So the spring will keep the valve fully open, FO, and you have to use compressed air to close, ATC, air to close. Okay, so you'll see though that terminology. And when you buy the valve, you buy the valve either to fail closed or you buy it to fail open. That's a decision you make when you install the valve. And so we have to select that. 
as engineers. And there's, there can be a lot of discussion about which one is more appropriate over the other. Here's a different diagram that shows essentially the same detail. You've got springs, you've got your air inlet over there, and here the valve stem can be pushed down or up, and in this case it's direct acting. Air is used to close and it's normally open, N-O, normally open. Okay, so if, um, if this fails, it will fail in the open position and this will fail in the closed position here on the right. So we, we have to make that decision ahead of time and our decision making goes as follows. We choose the valve failure modes in such a way that we get the safest condition to exist. And that's often the point of contention is what is the safest condition? There is a lot of discussion that should take place when you're deciding FO or FC. Okay, we'll, we'll take a look at an example next about streams crossing each other. Um, so here, I mean, here we answered this question that the exothermic reaction should fail open for that reason. It's the safest of the two conditions. Um, so I'll, uh, let's take a look at, uh, oh shoot, okay, I don't have the example. I was thinking, let, let's look at the assignment example that you all have in your mind, right? So we have the idea that let me just draw it up quickly because I want to discuss it. I thought I had it in the slides. So we had the idea in the tutorial of a heat exchanger followed by another heat exchanger. And then we go to a flash vessel. And I'm just going to draw the valves over here. This was valve three, this was valve four, this was valve five. That was valve two. And this was valve one. Okay, so we've got this, we know this from the uh, tutorial. And valve one is for a process stream. Okay, so that's flow from another part of our process Valve V2 controls steam to the heat exchanger, so that's a utility. Valve 3 is the feed to the flash. Valve 4 is the liquid level out, and valve 5 is the vapor level out the flash. Okay, so let's, let's get rid of the easiest ones. Valve V2, fail open or closed? Closed, okay, so we'll go add to our diagram, fail closed. We don't want that utility heating up the feed to our process if it should fail and we don't care about the utility because it's a that's why it's a utility valve v4 and v5 fail open okay we fail open because we want the safest possible condition you do not want to accumulate material in a closed vessel okay so closing v4 and 5 would lead to a situation of unsafe buildup of liquid in here or vapor and potentially exceed the pressure rating of that vessel. Okay. So that vessel could, could, be, uh, could be ruptured in that case. So we fail open, allowing material to move out. V1, fail open or closed? Fail open. Other suggestions? Would it be like highly dependent on like where that process stream is going to? Okay, D is it dependent on where that process stream goes to? Okay, this is why we can't look at these examples in isolation. We have to look at the greater context. Um, and to answer that appropriately would require knowledge of what is happening to this process stream. So if this valve fails, this process stream is a hot stream. Okay, we want, it normally would be cooled down. If we fail open, we're going to cool that stream down and really not affect it. Okay? But if we fail open, we're also going to come across here. We're going to come across here now with more heat than we would have otherwise had. 
So we're actually sending more energy into the system if that valve fails open. And then this other process stream is not impacted. But that brings us to this discussion about V3. So to answer this, we should also be looking at V3. Fail open or closed? Open. 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 Suggestions for failing open? Or reasons, I should say. Okay. It goes through, um, the other two are failed open also, it'll just you still keep going through. Um, though I would put V1 as failed closed, because okay. then it's all coming through V3 and it's cool, and all it does is just stay in the liquid, and you'll just want to aim to deal with storing and refilling. Okay, so Sean's suggestion is to fail open over here. Uh, fail, closed. fail closed, sorry, fail closed over here and fail open here. With the reasoning that failing closed here, you're, you're, you're now bringing just a cold flow in to the tank, into the flash vessel, I should say. And remember, there was a control loop here for level. Okay, so now we've got cold feed coming in. We don't have energy coming into that stream. So it's a cold feed. It's primarily liquid. And we had a pump with the valve opening there. So that liquid level is going to be pulled out of the flash vessel. Okay, so it's that's still fairly safe in that mode, yeah. Are there like many situations where you have like all your valves failing at the same time? Right. So if they're if they're instrumented so that there's one compressed air line that gets split across these five, um, then then that could. But typically what we'll have have is that the instrument air comes to the valve from some location. Okay, now that instrument air is following along a beam or a, a corridor or a walkway overhead. So you've got these five lines coming through and then splitting out to the five L. So it depends where it's cut. Right? So yeah, they could all fail simultaneously or it could be someone just walking by and bumping this, pot, this hose off and disconnecting it. So you, you can't say. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So that is my point, is you do need more context for the, dis the decision of V1. Okay. So V1, depending on where this process stream is, and if downstream they can accept a stream that's really hot, that has not been cooled anymore, can they deal with it? Right? Is there maybe a tank you could divert this to, or can downstream handle a higher heat load? Then that would impact your choice for fail closed or fail open. But we could also fail closed here, right? So one valid decision is to actually fail closed there. Fail closed, fail closed. Now you've got no flow and no energy being transferred here, and this, the system just stops. And so then V5 and V4, there's no point of No, you would fail open because you're not sure if, they're gonna, if all five are going to fail simultaneously or if they're going to fail individually. So consider the individual case, you definitely want them to fail open. Okay. So as drawn there, fail closed, 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 and the last two open. That's probably the most safe. There's actually nothing happening in that system. You essentially shut the whole process down. Right, so you're certainly propagating. This, this fault will propagate upstream. Yeah, so you have to have the capacity to deal with it upstream, i.e. maybe a storage tank to deal with it. Okay, now it, what this plays into is this doesn't just happen and no one knows about it, okay? The moment these things happen, alarms get set off. And we know, we'll know that because we will have alarms for pressure, we'll have alarms for level, and we will have alarms for flow. Okay, so that plays into the next topic, um, 
where these alarms are set off. Now, the alarms are acted on by the operator. So this, this layers that we have, we've got the control system, BPCS. The next layer here, alarms, is no action takes place. We simply announce to the operators auditor uh, in an audible way as well as in a visual way that something has occurred. Okay, so here's, here's the process that happens. A fault is occurring and we see here that this blue line breaches the alarm limit. So we specify that alarm limit. That's our decision as well as engineers. And at that particular point in time, an audible sound is created in the control room and a visual light is blinking to let the operator know. The operator can go and acknowledge the alarm. So they push a button and say, okay, I know that this problem occurs and the light stops blinking but stays lit and the sound just goes away. Okay? Now the operator has a chance to deal with the issue then and hopefully she or he's taking action to bring that variable back under the alarm limit. The moment that, action, that variable comes below the alarm limit, the light goes off. Okay? Now, let's look at an extreme example of this. Okay, so that's just a, the video is posted. You can go watch it and get a bit more. It's it's an extreme case, right? It's a nuclear reactor shut down, and it's a demo. So it's not the guy wouldn't be standing there talking about what's happening. Um, <laughs> but what's interesting there are the alarm is the alarm panel, right? So there's orange, there's green, and there's red alarms being indicated on that panel for low priority, medium priority, and high priority alarm. So there's not only just an alarm, it's also prioritized. So as the engineer, you not only set the alarm level, you also say this is a high priority alarm, medium, or a low priority alarm. Okay, so that, um, you, but what you got there from that is the auditory aspect as well as in mo more modern control rooms, um, there's a visual like panel like so over here there'll be a, a, a simulation of the process, a diagram drawn that indicates where that alarm is occurring as well. Now, the common problem is that there's too many alarms. We go to our PNIDs and we say, okay, I need an alarm here, I need an alarm there. And the next thing, we've got alarms happening regularly and far too many. And, it's not uncommon that here, here was one paper that looked at alarms in a plant, 17 alarms per hour, and the operator really only acted on 8% of them. So all those others are what we use that English expression, crying wolf. And if you don't know what that expression means, you can look it up. But essentially, it's, it's creating false alarms. And eventually, all these false alarms are ignored. And then when a real problem happens, we don't pay attention to it. So... Um, as an engineer, one of the best things that you could actually go do for your operators is to go look at the alarm logs and figure out which ones really are actually meaningful and which ones can be automated away. So many alarms we just put in place because we're too lazy as engineers to put a control loop on it. Right? So some alarms can be acted on in an automatic way. If they're reoccurring so frequently, you've got to ask yourself, well, why? Right? An alarm isn't an alarm if it's happening all the time and it's a false alarm. Then that's indicating that someone has not thought about the reason why they've put that alarm on or that alarm could be, have been dealt with in an automated way. So help your operators out a little bit by um, creating less noise and more signal. Okay, so it's the, we'll talk about this in 4C, type 1 error and type 2 error. It's the probability of you telling there is a problem when none exists or it's the probability of there is a problem, but you don't pick it up. Okay, so you don't want um, either case, but as I'll prove to you in 4C, you can't have both. You, you, they trade off, right? So you trade off those two probabilities against each other. Okay, so in the flash process you saw in the tutorial, um, there's several alarms drawn on the sheet for you. I, I had LAH and LAL. 
So let's understand that terminology. L is level. The A is alarm. The second A is always for alarm. It's not for composition. And the L is for low, the H is for high. So low alarm, high alarm. Why low alarm? That's the easy one. Pump doesn't run dry. High alarm. You don't want to send liquid up a line that's guaranteed to normally be vapor. Okay, so downstream from that, there might be an adsorber that only expects vapor phase. There might be units that only expect vapor. And so sending liquid up there can be catastrophic from an equipment perspective. And so in fact, LAH might be a high priority alarm because it will lead to significant damage of equipment. Okay, so if we're looking at prioritizing these things, hazards to people or equipment are high priority. Medium priority is it will affect your profit, okay, but it's not going to cause danger to people or equipment. And low is you just go and investigate why that occurred when you have time available. That's the typical ranking. And so LAH would actually be a, a high priority alarm because you don't want to damage what's coming downstream. PAH is high priority because high pressure in a vessel should never occur. Right? We shouldn't be breaching those pressures. We'll look next week um, at relief, pressure relief in a vessel. And then lastly, AAH is a high alarm on quality, on your light key. So that's a, that analyzes there for your light key. If you start sending too much light key down here, a high alarm, you're losing money. Right? So that's, a, that's an economic alarm. You could be damaging your pump, so LAL, yeah, it's high priority. Okay, because it's indicating that this control loop isn't able to fix the level, and that indicates something's wrong with the vapor liquid equilibrium, and the operator should be investigating that before it leads to equipment damage. Now, the next section is on safety interlock systems. So safety interlocks, just be careful here. The word interlock also exists very closely related to this topic on PNID diagrams. You'll see this word. There's an interlock here for this reason. And interlocks are not the same as safety interlocks. Interlocks are instrumentation that we put on a process so that we get sequencing occurring, right? So if you're starting up a reactor, the liquid in the tank has to be there before you can turn the impeller on. So you might have an interlock that prevents the operator from hitting start imp impeller if the liquid level in the vessel isn't high enough. Okay, that's not the same as an SIS. That's, a, that's an instrumentation decision that someone has figured out. We must have liquid in the tank, and then you interlock that with the impeller start button to prevent... Um, starting up without liquid in the tank. Now what we're dealing with here is a little different. SIS is your operators have not been able to deal with this problem. We now go to the next layer and we try to bring the process, and this could be fairly aggressive, to a state which is far less hazardous. The action taken by the SIS system will almost certainly cause you economic damage you're going to pay a lot of money for that SIS trigger because you're going to put the process in such a state where the product being produced there is probably not saleable um, and you probably won't even be able to salvage it to some extent. So it's costly when SIS is hit. Now, it's definitely for an unusual situation. So what we need to recognize is um, when we put an SIS in, we actually can prevent the process from starting up. Let me uh, perhaps come back to that after I've shown you this example here. Okay, so here's an example of a safety interlock system. Yes, sorry, Mark. Yeah. It's not SIS. That's just a, a regular interlock. Okay, and there's many examples of interlocks that exist um, in processes. The Let's see what's going on here. This is a boiler. We've got water. And what you can imagine is something sort of like 10 feet by 10 feet big and about the height of this room. So three, about two, three stories high. 
and you've got a large container above us with water in it and these pipes coming down the side of the walls and then they loop back up again, back into the boiler. And you've got this large flame going in the center. So that all this radiant heat from the flame. And this water comes down the tube and back up again. So it's being driven, notice there's no pump here, right? So as the water is coming down the tube, it's being heated by this flame. It's starting to boil, bubbles form in here. And just because this side is less dense than that side, it's naturally going to siphon itself back up again. So it's a totally automatic system um, based on the principle of density differences. So you go back up to the top, you've got meet the water again, the steam decouples and the steam goes off to the, to the next part of the process. Now, the safety interlock works here for this simple reason that the level must be within a certain lower limit. If water runs out over here, right, if water runs low, this controller will open that pipe and put more water in. So we'll always keep a constant liquid level. So that variable is there for safety as well as for just operation of the process, that control loop. Now, let's say that level gets below some critical lower bound, L123 minimum. There's some lower bound then we want to reduce that fuel to zero. We want to absolutely cut that fuel because if we've got no liquid in these pipes, remember we've already, the control systems already tried to fix this. The operators have already tried to fix it and now we're still not able to fix it, right? So this is fairly far on in the development of the problem. We want to cut the fuel and that's a problem, right? Because you're gonna have to start this boiler up again later on, these pipes contract, they expand. The last thing you want to do is turn your flame off because that expansion contraction can cause the pipes to crack and when you start up again it may, it's not guaranteed to start up without leaks. So we really don't like turning these boilers off once they're actually running. But we're going to. We want to shut the fuel down completely. So the way we would do this in this situation is by adding the SIS system. Now let's take a look here. There's a lot on this diagram. So we want to cut that fuel completely. Not just say we want it off with a little bit leaking through, we want it entirely shut. So we put a second valve in here. And both these valves are fail closed. That's for a different reason. They're fail closed for safety reasons, for um, if instrument air fails. But what happens here is when the SIS logic kicks in. So the SIS logic says, if that level is below a critical limit, take action. Well, what is the action? Here's two actions. We're going to close both valves to guarantee no fuel coming in. And here's a new piece of instrumentation we use. We use a solenoid valve for this. Okay. Now, a solenoid valve looks as follows. Notice there's three, three little pieces to it. Um, so there's your solenoid valve. So one, two, three entries, and then a bit of um, mechanical stuff in there. So the solenoid valve is going to shut the line for us. Let's see how. The way that that solenoid works is it gets a signal from the SIS. So as long as the plant is running, what position do we want this valve to be in? If things are running normally, this valve needs to be fully open. Right? This valve isn't here. This valve wasn't here before. Right? Under the regular operation, we didn't actually need it. So it needs to be fully open, as if it were not there. So the signal that must come down to this valve during regular operation is be fully open. Now it's a fail close valve, so it's going to shut. So we're going to need air to open it. So it's ATC, fully closed. It's going to need air to open. We're going to need 15 PSIGs of air to keep it open, to pop that valve up. So 15 PSIGs get sent there and get transferred right through to the valve, keeping it fully open. When SIS comes in and triggers a, a failure, so the level is too low, that solenoid changes the opening from that port 
to this port. So during the SIS trigger, we simply let the signal that comes in, instead of being this signal, we let the signal coming in be this one, and it will go to the valve. Well, what is this signal coming in? It's air, it's atmosphere. Okay? So we send a signal to this valve, atmospheric, there's no air, no air to open. It's as if someone cut the line to the valve, so it will fail closed. Okay? Everyone understand the three-way valve there? Let's take a look at the second SIS, uh, sorry, the second um, solenoid valve. Same deal, we're measuring pressure here on the steam. So that number is going to be really high, and we can pull off a, uh, some of that pressure signal from that controller. And let's take a look back here, right? What we were doing, we were controlling pressure in the steam by opening and closing the fuel. So you need more pressure, open up your fuel, you need less pressure, close your fuel. So that control loop is still required. Well, afterwards, we keep that loop there, but we pass that loop through another solenoid. So the regular control loop, regular operation, we're accepting this signal from the pressure controller, whatever PSIG it is, and pass it straight to the valve. During SIS, when we trigger the failure, we switch from that input to atmosphere again, and that valve closes. So both valves fully shut, turning off your fuel completely. Okay, any questions on that? Yeah. Yeah, they're pneumatic airlines, yeah, yeah. Okay, so what's the other thing we see here? We see a second level sensor. So we previously just had LC here. Remember we said that each of these blocks is independent of the other. The safety interlock block must operate completely independently of the process control block. So the worst thing you could go do, and companies do this regularly, is they say, well, I'm not going to buy another level sensor. I've already measuring level. So I'm just going to use this level sensor from over here as my in SIS input. So the SIS, we need to know level. So every few milliseconds, the computer, which is where SIS gets implemented, the computer finds level. Is it less than L123? If no, just keeps looping around. And every few milliseconds, it just runs that control loop. Okay? The moment that it triggers that criteria, then we, imp we implement SIS. Well, if you're really lazy, you'll just simply use that level value. But that's not smart because now you've not got independence between your layers. So to enforce independence to our layers, we have to buy a second level sensor. And we don't just buy another one of the same type. We actually buy one that uses a very different principle. Okay, so think back to BP Texas City. They had alarms and sensors on their columns. But if you've got two of the same technology, that's really no good. You need them of different technologies. And BP had that, right? BP had two different principles, and we should go do that. So that's a good feature, is to have two different types of technologies. Yeah, okay, if you're going to use both sensors, you're sort of getting parallelism and then, but you're still, you're like crossing there, there, right? So it could be that that one sensor is out for maintenance and then you're using that same, same sensor. We'll talk a bit about redundancies next, okay? Um, so let's just hold that thought. So we have to put a different, sen a different technology independent sensor over there for this to work. Um, just want to make sure I covered everything here. Oh, yes, the other important thing is, of course, SIS being an automatic system um, could happily operate, and we never know that it's been activated. Right? So when SIS gets triggered, a very high priority alarm must be sent to the operators so that they're aware that SIS has occurred. Otherwise, the operators have no idea that fuel has been shut down if, if that's happening. So, so, so some key principles here. Use instrumentation, but it's got to be redundant and use a diversity of sensor principles. And then the second re uh, issue is alarm to your operator when that SIS action takes place. 
Okay, that is, that is very critical. Let's, um, I'm just going to, there's an example here in the notes. I will give it to you to work on over the weekend. Uh, but I do want to just jump over to this, uh, that issue there that Joseph in, mentioned. Um, we can also have our, our systems use multiple information. So if the level is too low or the temperature is high, then trigger the SIS. Okay. Now, this becomes an issue when let's say that level sensor has to be maintained. So we have to calibrate it periodically. So what happens then? We know that the moment we go take L123 out for calibration, we're going to trigger this alarm and cause the process to shut down. So we do actually need a way to bypass the SIS. Now this seems a little bit of a problem. Remember Bhopal three safety interlock systems were bypassed by the operators, okay? But they were bypassed while the process was trying to be started up and operating normal. So here, the key is, if you're going to calibrate a sensor or maintain the sensor during process operation, you have to be cognizant of this happening and m absolutely minimize that time, okay? And have, have some good process monitoring on the process so you can read other instruments, other pressures, other flows, other levels, so that you can observe if everything is operating safely. Okay, and the operators have to know about it. You can't just send someone out from an external company to come in and calibrate, and the operators have no idea what's, what's going on. And then the final uh, issue about SIS is uh, redundancies. So if this is a critical loop that can cause significant property or injury, um, you will have multiple sensors. You won't just rely on one input, okay? So that sensors are notorious for failing, for having blips and spikes, right? So this is done for a good reason because it will have a spike periodically and you don't want the process to be triggered based just on an abnormality in the signal. So what we'll typically do is we'll put a very short delay. It's not just if that temperature exceeds a certain value, We'll say, if that temperature exceeds that certain value for five or more seconds, then trigger the alarm. So you put a very small window on there to make sure that, you, that it's not just a very quick spike or a blip in your data. The other um, system that you'll have is a voting system. So two out of three sensors must agree. Okay, you'll never have two sensors coming in here. You always have, it's either one or three, right? You wouldn't have two coming in. So you have a voting system taking place. And what Dr. Marlin shows you here is the probability of false shutdowns drastically decreases and the probability of failure occurring without you knowing it. So there is an there's a need for an alarm, but you don't pick it up. That drops as well. So but that's your type 1 and your type 2 error. Okay, so what I'm going to hand out here for you to work on, and there's two sides to this diagram, so you get to practice twice, um, is this particular system. I would like you to design a st a SIS for this reactor. So let's just quickly take a look at the story here. Here's a reactor. Exothermic reaction takes place. And under normal operation, we need to cool that vessel. So there's your cooling water. You've got your reactants and your cold solvent coming in. And you don't want to exceed a certain temperature. So normal operation, cold water comes in, reactant and solvent. For startup, though, you need to get your reactor up to temperature so you actually start getting a reaction occurring. During startup only, we'll send hot water into this jacket. Okay, so that, that is normally off, but during startup, that could be on. So if SIS is triggered with too high a temperature, what are you going to shut down? So think about that and add on the SIS for this. So I'm, Pass these around during any time. No, uh, so, sorry, during regular operation. So what SIS would you add on here for regular operation? So we'll look at this in next class. You can think about it a little.